So let's dive in today. The inspiration for this message comes from, uh, this is not our main text, but this is where the inspiration comes from. It comes from Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. In this message today, uh, that I feel like God has asked me to deliver to you is called uh, the day of small things. And in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, there's uh, a verse that says, the one who has despised the day of small things, that person is going to rejoice. And the context of this in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 10, were the exiles coming home uh, from Babylon back to Israel to rebuild the temple. And there were some young people who were really excited, obviously, be, to be delivered from their slavery and their oppression and to be taking up the task of God to rebuild the temple. And so they were really excited about what God was doing in their midst. There were some older people, though, that were familiar, whether they themselves had seen it or by story, they were familiar with the glory of the former temple that had been destroyed, and they were not that excited about what God was doing in their midst. They felt like it was too slow and too small, and that's where that scripture comes to us in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. Whoever has despised the day of small things will rejoice. We are often the kind of people who despise the small things. Austin actually talked about this a couple of weeks ago. He talked about how God... Often his work starts small and slow and he works patiently. And so this scripture about despising the day of small things and the person who does that rejoicing, it's actually a few things to us today. Number one, it's a warning. Don't be the kind of person who despises the day of small things, which is also the title of my message. So don't be the kind of person who despises my message today. It's a warning. If you are the kind of person who misses the small things, you're going to miss out on some of the really important things that God is doing. It's also a really vivid picture of the steadfast love of the Lord. Whoever despises the day of small things shall rejoice. So there were some people who despised the day of small things, but their um, disposition toward the small activity of God was not an obstruction to him moving in their midst for their good. That's a beautiful thing. That's called grace around here. In the Old Testament, that's called steadfast love. Uh, my family, during Advent, we've been reading the Jesus Storybook Bible, which talks about steadfast love a lot. Maybe you've been reading the Jesus Storybook Bible too, and that's awesome. Anybody read the Jesus Storybook Bible? Sally Lloyd-Jones, who wrote it, she talks often as she tells the stories of the Old Testament about the steadfast love of the Lord, and she calls it never stopping never giving up, unbreakable, always and forever love. And this word in Zechariah chapter four, verse 10, that was the inspiration for this message is a warning, don't despise the day of small things. It's also a reminder that even if you do, that is not an obstruction to God working for your good, amen? And then lastly, it's my prayer today. It's just something I've been praying into, that today, that no one in this room would despise this day of small things that we're gonna talk about today. But that even if you do, that there will be a day, maybe today, or maybe in the very near future, that because of the, the beautiful work of God in your life, that you would rejoice. Amen? So that's where we're going today. All that was preliminary. So let's dive into our very short text today, an obscure text, an enigmatic text, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Here's what it says. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, see the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan and each one of us there get a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And this dwelling, this place under his charge, this is more of a, like a picture of discipleship, a place of learning, not a lake house by the Jordan River uh, to, to vacation. They wanted to be a place where they could learn from Elisha just as Elisha had done from Elijah. And we'll talk about that a little more in a sec. Verse three, then one of them said, Elisha, you should be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. Verse four, so Elisha went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. I'm gonna stop just for a second there. A day of small things. Everybody say a day of small things. What's going on in this uh, historical context is the nation of Israel is divided uh, between north and south, Israel and Judah. The kingdom divided over um, 
idolatry, basically, in the North especially, but the South was not immune from that. The form that their idolatry took was uh, mass amounts of violence, um, lots of immorality, the oppression of the poor and the weak. And for all these reasons, the kingdom of Israel divided North and South, Israel and Judah is in turmoil during this time. At the micro level, we have this character introduced to us named Elisha. And some of you may remember that he was the apprentice, the protege, the disciple of Elijah. So don't be confused. There was Elijah who preceded Elisha. And among the many things that we could say at the end of Elijah's life, Elisha, having walked with him for a bit, saw so much of the power of God in Elijah's life that he asked Elijah that he would be able to receive a double portion of the blessing that rested upon Elijah. You might remember this story if you're familiar with the story of the Old Testament. And so it happened that there was a day Elijah had told Elisha, hey, if you're here on the day of my departure, then you will indeed receive the double portion. And you might remember that Elijah was carried up into the heavens by a chariot of fire. And indeed, Elisha had stuck with him on that day and Elisha received a double portion of the blessing that was upon Elijah. And even if you count the miracles that Elijah did, Elisha actually did two times the amount of miracles by count that Elisha had done, or Elijah had done. And today, the story of Elisha, this little story that we had, this obscure, enigmatic story, is one of the miracles that Elisha did, if that makes sense. We also have the school of the prophets. And among uh, many things that we would say, again, this is a, a company of people trying to learn the ways of Yahweh, particularly the ways of the prophet from Elisha. And all that I'll say about them is just that they were basically hated by the kings of Israel because they were calling out their idolatry, violence, immorality, oppression. So they were hated by most of the kings. They were hated by foreign nations because of God's activity. And we see that in the story that follows this story. And because the kings despised them, they stirred up animosity toward the prophets among the people. And so a lot of the people despised the prophets. And so the one thing that we want to say about the school of the prophets is they were just a marginalized community. And that's very clear as you read through this story. Um, there were many of them. There was very few of them. A lot of times they were alone and they were very much looked down upon and in some cases killed and persecuted. And so this is all the characters that we have in the story. This is a little of the context that's going on around this story. So let's keep reading. In verse five, but as one was felling a log, everybody say felling a log. That's a great term. As one was felling a log, his ax head fell into the water. Uh Uh-oh. And he cried out, alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, take it up. So he reached out his hand and he took the ax head up. A day of small things. Everybody say a day of small things. This is not the most famous story in the Bible, you may have noticed. How many of you have never heard this story before? Did not know that this was a story that actually existed. Awesome. This day is for you. A day of small things. There were three things that I felt strongly that the Lord wanted me to to share with you from this story today. Here's the first one. God cares about you in the everyday stuff of your life. God cares deeply about you in the everyday stuff of your life. Say, well, how do you know? Well, this story is a great example of that. First of all, this story, one of the beautiful things about it is it's sandwiched between two other stories that seem way more important. And that's kind of the point. The story that precedes this story is a story about a a famous general named Naaman. And I referenced the Jesus Storybook Bible earlier, but in the Jesus Storybook Bible, we were just reading with my family during Advent, the story of Naaman, this mighty general who was afflicted with the disease that we think was leprosy. And in his story, he has this Israelite servant girl, a girl who we don't know for sure, but her family was very likely killed potentially by Naaman's army. And she was taken from her home to be a slave in his house. And this story is so beautiful because instead of this girl being filled with resentment and hatred toward Naaman, instead of this girl being filled with resentment and hatred toward Yahweh for her circumstance, 
she sees Naaman in his sickness and she actually believes that if he will attend to his relationship with Yahweh, if he will go and speak to the prophet Elisha, that he might be able to be healed. And that story is a story about how because of the faithfulness of this girl and the forgiveness of this girl, in a very, very hostile and dark situation, Naaman is healed on the inside and the outside. It's a beautiful story. That's not our story today. That's the important story that comes before this story. After this story is another important story. I think it's, I've heard it several times and I think it's relatively well known, but it's actually a story about the king of Syria trying to take out Elisha. And it's actually a story about black ops and covert operations. And in the dark of night, some of his best troops come and surround Elisha and his servants. And the servant of Elisha is exceedingly afraid because he's looking out at all these soldiers who have now surrounded him. He thinks they're going to die. And Elisha tells him, don't worry, man. Those that are for us are more than those that are against us. And in a beautiful turn of events, Elisha prays that his servant will have sight. And he looks outside and he sees that actually they're not only surrounded by this army who's wanting to take them captive, but that army is surrounded by the heavenly hosts. The ones that were for them were more than the ones that were against them. Now, that's an important story, too. And those are the two important stories around the story of the axe head, which doesn't seem very important. Unless you consider that in the midst of stories about mighty generals and geopolitical machinations, that God wants you to know that he cares about you in the everyday stuff of your life. That's why this story is here. Not only that, what's the big deal about the loss of an axe head? I mean, what would he do? I mean, you imagine this guy, we don't have these details in the story, but I'm sure this was the I've got it guy. Y'all know that guy. Hey, we need to chop down some trees. We got this one ax head and there's some guy, it's like, I got this. This was probably that guy, we don't know. This is probably that guy, I've got this. First big hack, ax head straight into the lake. Right, y'all know that guy. Some of you are that guy. <clears throat> You think, oh, well, they lost an axe head. They'll just go get another one. That's no problem. We'll just get somebody else's axe. Oh, it was borrowed. No big deal. We'll borrow another one. Maybe not. Two problems here with the axe head. Number one is in Exodus chapter 22, the law very clearly stipulates that if you lost someone else's property, that you were on the hook to pay it back. Here's what Exodus 22:14 14 says. It says, if a man borrows anything of his neighbor and it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it, this person will make full restitution. So this person is on the hook for the ax head. Now, could that person have forgiven him and say, hey, you don't need to pay me back? Sure. But by law, he had to make restitution. And this is not a rich person. This is a marginalized prophet living on the fringes of society, and he's hated by almost everyone. So maybe it wouldn't be just a cut and dry thing. Like, sure, I'll forgive this debt. It's like, no, dude, you owe me an ax head, and you're going to pay it back because I don't like you. Would have been a very likely and possible scenario profit, I will get my axe head back. That's also complicated by the fact that iron was exceedingly rare in these days. Look at this. I had never read this until I started studying this story, but this was a couple of hundred years before this story in 1 Samuel. Look at what it says. It says, there was no black, blacksmith to be found throughout the land of Israel. And the Philistines told the Israelites, you guys aren't going to be making any swords or spears. Every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines if they had to get something sharpened. This plowshare, his mattock, his axe, or his sickle. So on the days of battle, there was neither sword nor spear in the hand of any of the people when they fought. This is unbelievable. In battles that Jonathan and Saul fought, the Israelites were not well equipped with tools of iron and weapons like axes. Actually, only royalty had those. It says only Jonathan and Saul had those kind of things. All that to say, you lose an axe head, it's not a small thing, actually. What looks like a day of small things is not actually a day of small things. Actually, this is not even one of the points, but how many times do we presume about someone's situation, like, oh, that's no big deal, but you actually have no idea. It is kind of a big deal, but you just don't know all the context around it. That was like a free point. 
So the loss of this axed has this marginalized profit in jeopardy. And if he can't repay this axed, which was very likely to be extremely valuable, he's going to probably enter into indebted servitude to the person who owned the axe, which is going to wreck his future and his family. And so another thing I wanted to tell you, just to double down on what I already said, is not only does God care about you in the everyday stuff of your life, but he does so especially if you are in a vulnerable situation. God cares especially for the vulnerable. He pays special attention and gives special care to the vulnerable. You cannot read the Old Testament or the New Testament, the ministry of Jesus, and not come away thinking that God pays special attention to the vulnerable. Well, why does he do that? Are those who are vulnerable more valuable than those who are not? No. The Old Testament is constantly giving instructions to the people about how they ought to treat widows and sojourners and foreigners. Well, why does it always do that? It does that because those people are in a vulnerable state and very likely to experience poverty and oppression. And so because God cares so much about people in that situation, he commands his people to take special care of them. And in this story, he acts supernaturally to take care of one who is vulnerable. They did not fish the iron out of the water. The supernatural power of God was directed towards a vulnerable one and the laws of gravity were suspended and iron floated in the water and they grabbed it out. This is the extent to which God cares about people in the everyday stuff of their life, especially if you're in this room and you find yourself in a vulnerable place. Amen? I hear that applause. (laughs) Some of us, we can't get settled on whether or not God loves us and cares for us and sees us and knows us. And one of the things, uh, as I was walking through the Gospel of John not that long ago, John takes great pains to show that Jesus is the one who really loves and really cares, and that's demonstrated in how he sees and how he knows and how he acts. There's actually this story in John chapter one about when Jesus meets Nathaniel and Philip takes Nathaniel to meet Jesus. He's telling him, hey, I think we found the Messiah. You should come check this guy out. And here's what it says in John chapter one. (coughs) Philip had told him that Jesus was from Nazareth and he was potentially the Messiah. And Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to Jesus, you remember this? How do you know me, man? We never met before. How do you know what I'm like? How do you know what I think? You don't know me. Back up, Jesus. Jesus answered him. Listen to this. Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi. Indeed, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. The manifestation of Jesus' love and care for Nathanael was that he saw him and he knew him even though they had never met. And when Nathanael internalized the steadfast love of God that sees and knows and cares and acts, he thought, wow, this person truly is the son of God. I want to follow you. And Jesus says, hey, man, that's awesome. You you, you came to believe that just just because I see you, just because I care about you, and the form that that caring takes is sight and knowledge. There's even greater things than these ahead. What if you could get it settled in your life today that indeed God cares about you? And I don't mean this in a way like you could just muster up enough internal fortitude. I mean, what if you could just look around and see what God is doing, all the ways that he is caring for you, everything that he has done, everything that he is. What if you could receive that today? What if you could believe it? And what if you could get it settled that indeed God cares for you, especially in the everyday stuff of life, and especially if you're vulnerable, and that could set you on a trajectory to see even greater things. Some of us, maybe we're being kept from greater things in the kingdom of God because we can't get it settled that God actually loves us. And we're just kind of going around that track. And Jesus is like, man, I do love you. And it's awesome. And you should definitely follow me. 
But if we could get that settled, maybe we could see even greater things than these. That's what he tells Nathaniel. So God cares for us in the everyday stuff of life, especially if you're vulnerable. I also just wanted to say to you today, and I felt like God wanted me to say it, that God can restore the thing that you think is lost. Like this is, this is what he does. That's one of the things this story is literally screaming at you is something that people thought was lost and unattainable came back by the power of God, amen? Is God, are there things that you can't have today? Probably, a lot of things. Are there things that you might never get back on this side of heaven? Probably. But there is a lot of other things that you can have back that God wants to give you back, that he wants to direct the full power and resources of heaven toward you to give you back that which was lost. You can have what was lost restored. There's a bunch of people sitting in this room that if we ask, hey, have you ever had the Lord supernaturally restore something that you thought was lost? People will be raising their hands all over this room. It's because God loves to restore that which was lost. That's one of the things this story is just reminding you of today is don't be a person who doubts that that thing that you lost can't come back today. Somebody is sitting in this room and you've been doubting. You think it can't come back. That relationship is never coming back. The passion and the love and the romance in this marriage is never coming back. This financial situation is never coming back. God has the power to restore that which you've lost. And that's just what this story is. I'm just like telling you what this says. I'm just reminding you of what God would want you to hear today and believe today. Is he going to restore everything that you've lost now? No, everything is not yet fulfilled, but one day he will. Sickness and death will be no more. Every tear will be wiped away and everything that we have lost will be restored. And until that day, it's not just like waiting around. It's not a zero sum proposition where we get nothing now and we get everything later. It's like, no, we pray for the kingdom of God to come on earth as it is in heaven now. Amen. Amen. I'm just thinking about Joel chapter two, my namesake. I was named after Joel, the minor prophet. Joel chapter two, verse 25. He will restore to you the years that the locust has stolen. Is ringing in my ears. Psalm chapter 27, verse 13, where David says, I would have despaired unless I believed I was gonna see the goodness of God not in the great hereafter, in the land of the living. He can restore what you've lost. And so lastly, got one more thing. Can y'all handle one more thing? It's going great. This one, maybe it's for you. I hope it's for you. It probably should be for you, but I'm 100% sure it's for me. This was the thing that God was telling me as I was reading this story. As I was reading the stories around this story, as I was thinking about this day of small things, and I was thinking about heading into 2024, this was the thing that I couldn't get out of my heart that I felt God was saying to me. And so I'm going to share it with you. Maybe it's for you. I hope it's for you, but I'm sure it's for me. And that's this. Not only does this story communicate that God cares for us in the everyday stuff of life, especially in the small things, not only is it a reminder that indeed God has the power to restore the things that you've lost. This story landed on me and said, Joel, you don't have to settle for a life unacquainted with the power of God. I was reading all of these stories about Elisha and the thing that I was thinking was in Elisha's life, the things that seemed impossible became kind of routine. And it was just making me think, the Jesus people, the people of God, do not have to settle for lives unacquainted with the power of God. And we ought not do that. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. As we've said, we pray for the kingdom of God to come on earth as it is in heaven. You say, oh, well, This is an Old Testament story. I mean, that's kind of like what God did back then. It's just not really like that now. I mean, there aren't any Elishas walking around now. And it's like, dude, have you read the New Testament? Have you read the book of Acts? I don't even have time to really tell you this. But in Acts chapter 14, stuff was going on among the people at the hands of Paul and Barnabas. And they thought Paul and Barnabas were literal gods. 
They said, Zeus and Hermes have come down among us because the power of God was so present in their ministry. You don't have to settle for a life unacquainted with the power of God. That's what all these stories are reminding and screaming at me as I read and think about this text. So last thing, a couple weeks ago, Austin talked about his love of trees. Anybody remember that? He was talking about like his present age, he's really come to appreciate trees and that's nice. Trees are nice. I like trees. Trees have provided a lot of shade in my life, so I don't want to throw any shade back at the trees. However, when you become a man of a certain age, you can graduate from trees to birds. (laughs) You don't even know how much I love birds. If I had a mind, I would pull up my phone right now and pull out a text that I sent to my wife just nary a few days ago. It's a list of birds that were in my backyard that day. (laughs) Downy woodpecker, golden-fronted woodpecker, blue jays, cardinals, sparrows, brown-headed cowbirds, Harris hawk, slate-colored junco that came all, I've been waiting on that slate-colored junco. I've kept telling Carrie like, hey, the juncos haven't been here yet. They come all the way from Canada. I don't know if it's because it hasn't been freezing here yet, but guess what? Last week, he was there. I love birds. I brought a picture of a bird for you today that I really love. Check this out. I heard it. Somebody knows what it is. Who said that? My man. (laughs) Crested Caracara. We can just call him CC. Look at all of his beauty and glory. He's amazing. In fact, you're really lucky. Most of the people in the United States don't get to see him. This is about as far north as he comes. We used to live in Corpus Christi. I used to see CCs all the time, Crested Caracaras, all the time. Check him out. He's got some nice, sharp talons, right? Those talons are not not a joke. They were not no joke. I mean, I'm from East Texas. That's what we say. It's not no joke. It'll scratch you. I can take down some prey. He's got a nice sharp beak, can tear into some flesh when needed. Now, if you want to see a crested caracara, and my man right here probably already knows this, it's not going to be where you think. I mean, this guy has all the features of a hawk, and actually, technically, he is a falcon. So he has features of a hawk. He's technically a falcon. By the way, the fastest animal in the world is a falcon, peregrine falcon. Check it out. This is one of those types of falcon. If I was going out hawk hunting or falcon hunting, I'd be looking in the skies. In fact, I just told you I saw a Harris hawk in my backyard the other day. And guess how I knew it was, a hawk was coming? All the doves, like 20 doves, boom, scattered about. And I knew a hawk was coming. So I looked to the skies and sure enough, whoo, zooming over my roof, a hawk. But if you want to see a crested caracara, you're not going to look where hawks are. Because even though this dude has all the tools of a hawk and is technically a falcon, he lives like a buzzard. If you want to see a crested caracara, just look on the side of the road somewhere where there's a dead armadillo or a possum or a squirrel that got ran over. Because you might find our crested friend there. And I've always thought that this story about this particular bird that I truly do love was like a little parable about living below the giftings that we've been given. And so many of us, even though, I mean, the scripture says that we've been given everything for life and godliness, as we've said a couple of times, the very power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is at work within the Jesus people. We tend to settle for lives that are unacquainted with the power of God. And this story is just reminding us today that it doesn't have to be that way. Amen? So I hope that you carry these things into 2024. I hope that... You see some greater things in 2024 because you get settled in your heart and in your mind that God cares for you in the shape and the form that his care takes is seeing you and knowing you and providing for you, especially if you're vulnerable. I pray that you have faith, even if it's the size of a mustard seed or because of God's steadfast love, even if you don't have faith today, it's not going to stop God working for your good where I said that. So 
I hope you have faith the size of a mustard seed, but even if you don't, that's not going to stop God from working for good. But I hope that you believe that God can restore some things that you feel like were lost. And I hope that in 2024, you resolve that I'm not going to live a life unacquainted with the power of God. Amen? So let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together today. Thank you for this little story. Hopefully that serves as a vivid reminder of how much you love us, even in the small things. In a day of wars, in Europe, in the Middle East, big geopolitical movement. You care deeply about those things, but you also care about the little things in our lives. And I pray that this story would remind us of that. I pray that in this room that you would put a new song in some people's heart, a song of restoration, that you would give them back the things that they think were lost and that they will sing that song and that many people would see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And I pray that we would not settle for lives unacquainted with your power and that we would use the tools and the resources, the gifts, the people, all of the things that you've given us so that we could experience abundant life, life to the fullest, the kingdom of God on earth here as it is in heaven. Would you do these things by the power of your spirit and in Jesus' name, amen.